ഓം നമസ്യ ഗുഡ് ഈവനിങ് എവരിബഡി വിൽ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ടുഡേ സെഷൻ വിത്ത് എ പ്രയർ ഓം ധ്യായാമോ ധവളാവകുംധനവതി തേജോമയീം നൈഷ്ടികി സിദ്ധാം പാങ്കവിലോകിനീ ഭഗവതി അന്ധസ്മിത ശ്രീമുഖി വാത്സല്യാമൃതവർഷിണീം സുമധുരം സംഘീർത്തനാലാപിനീ ക്ഷമാഗീ മധുസിക്തസൂക്തി സരസ്വതി so two major rivers we have already uh, like covered and today uh, we will be talking about another uh, very important river that is the uh, drishadvadi uh, river so drishadvadi is uh, basically uh, the, ma- the the major the, the largest tributary of saraswati and uh, it's a uh, have a beautiful name called drishadvadi which is thriving with saraswati so we know saraswati means uh, the river uh, with a lot of lakes in in the in its course so uh, saraswati is a river of lakes saras means lake saraswati is a river of lakes and alternative uh, the because there is a sanskrit terms can have uh, multiple meanings and the rishi is always Uh, are interested in uh, creating names with the uh, which have multiple uh, significance and so saraswati is the river of lakes and it can also means the river that flows between lakes uh, so that is another etymology of uh, saraswati and it also means flow sara means to move so saraswati also indicate the flowing of the water so these are all the kind of attributes coming from the the river name saraswati uh, so similarly is there anything significant about drishadvati so because the name is very much rhyming so drishadvati means the river of stones uh, stone means uh, drisha so drisha means the uh, you know, rocks pebbles stones etc so uh, the the rishis uh, because they are also geographers Uh, so they when they go around the river saraswati you know, they know that the, this uh, saraswati river is connecting many lakes and uh, when there is no water in the river saraswati uh, they it uh, you know the, the the course of the river appear like a series of lakes this is also the reason why uh, the saraswati river is called a rain fed river so compared to sindhu river which is a snow fed river where there is a perennial Uh, all the year there is a water flow river saraswati uh, sometimes uh, get reduced into lakes uh, when there is uh, less amount of water this is also another indication of the uh, the, the name is also because of the river saraswati that uh, river of lakes uh, the river containing lot of lakes the river that connects lot of lakes so so many such names for saraswati so correspondingly drishadvati the rishis found uh, there are so many rocks formation inside the lakes so the entire course of the river you will see uh, so many rocks where people can jump and um, cross the river and lot of pebbles and stones etc so that is why it is called drishadvati and just i will take the map uh, just now so i think i hope everybody can see the map so uh, here in the northern side you can see the river saraswati moving like this uh, with the manusha that is uh, uh, like uh, the region sacred to manu and uh, ilaspada uh, the, the manusha that is a region sacred to manu and then ilaspada that is the region sacred to ila manu's daughter and here is a bharati tirtha which is the the sacred spot of the goddess bharati the the patron goddess the kula devata of the bharata kings so all these sacred places are there in, along the river saraswati and there are two corners of kurukshetra that is uh, uh, 
this uh, Arantuka and Tarantuka. So two corners of Kurukshetra also on this, this Saraswati. So correspondingly, there is a river Drashatvati flowing like this. And uh, this river is having uh, these uh, two other slightly offset sometimes to, because the river course keep on changing. So two other uh, corners of Kurukshetra that is called uh, Machakruka. This is Machakruka and this is Ramakrata related to Parashurama. So uh, we have also seen in our previous uh, talks uh, that Saraswati and Rishatvati defines the, the Kurukshetra. So Kurukshetra is a uh, kind of a rectangular, maybe a trapezium kind of a uh, geographical region, a rectangular, a slightly inclined rectangular region uh, between uh, Saraswati and Drishatvati. So it is to the south of Drishatvati and uh, uh, so south of Saraswati and to the north of Drishatvati. And uh, this region is the sacred Kuru Kshetra. And of course, you in the map you see Drishatvati, you, there are so many other names. We know the Hariyupya is nothing but the northern course of uh, river Drishatvati, uh, which is flowing parallel to the Yavyavadi course, which is the Yam uh, Yamuna's uh, like alternate channel. So there is uh, this uh, Hariyupya and Yavyavadi we have seen in the one of, two of the first rivers. Of course, that Hariyupya is also Drishatvati, but uh, Rigveda treats Drishadvati uh, also having an independent uh, description, etc. in Rigveda. So that is why we are considering the Drishadvati like uh, in a separate class, uh, separate session, we are taking Drishadvati. First, uh, not only Hari, uh, the river has multiple names, not just Hariupiya, which is a Rigvedic uh, uh, river name in the early Rigveda in the sixth mandala, it is there. Apart from in the Mahabharata, it is called Raupya river which is a kind of a short, uh, no, you can see it's a kind of an abbreviation or a shortened form of Hariupya uh, that is captured into the Mahabharata as a Raupya river. And in Yudhishthira pilgrimage, uh, the, the pilgrimage of uh, Pandava King Yudhishthira and all the, the brothers, uh, uh, they were uh, traveling all over the Bharata Vasha and then they come back to Kurukshetra and then uh, guided by Rishi Lomasha. So there Lomasha mentioned, here is the Raupya river, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, in the Kurukshetra region, they mentioned the Raupya river actually. So that is another thing. And it has got another name in Rigveda that is called Kulisi, which we will uh, will come out in the subsequent uh, sessions. The Kulisi, the another name is Kulisi name. Uh, Kulisi, that is the name, another the third name, uh, fourth name of the Rishantpati, which we will see in the subsequent chapters. Uh, so the river identity, Drishadvati is primarily the identity uh, of the uh, river when it is uh, flowing in a kind of west to east direction like this, more or less. And uh, when it is in a uh, like uh, its upper course, north to south, uh, more or less it is considered as Hariupya. But of course, uh, the river being the same, the name can be applied to the entire course. So the entire uh, course uh, of uh, the river is also uh, like uh, very rightfully termed as Drishatvati and everything else is just synonymous to the alternate names for Drishatvati like Hariupya, Raupya, Kulisi, four alternate names for the same river. So that is what uh, Drishatvati is all about. And uh, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, the, it, it, the river have many stones. Uh, so that is why the name comes. Drishadvati means uh, having many stones. Drisha means stone, actually. So Drisha, Drisha means stone, like Drishadvati. And uh, uh, today, uh, now in our, in our today hydrology, uh, the river, the name Drishadvati is not uh, well known. I mean, the people nobody call this river as Drishadvati anymore. So instead of that, they call the upper channel as a Rakshi river. Rakshi, Rakshi is the name for this, this particular part of the river, Rakshi river. And of course, it is another uh, shorthand form of uh, no, Hariupya, something like this. Because Hariupya became Raupya and then because of some reason, currently this is called Rakshi river. And from here, it is called Chautang river. So these two rivers, uh, Rakshi and Chautang, uh, totally describe the, the channel of the river Saraswati, the ancient channel of the river Saraswati. 
and uh, uh, currently uh, like just like saraswati the the proper trishadvati is considered as like non existent or disappeared etc because this chautang and uh, rakshi rivers they are all converted into uh, drainage channels water drainage channels so uh, these are all part of the haryana uh, water authority and uh, uh, the nature of the river is modified and it it is now a kind of more or less uh, kind of a cemented channel uh, kind of a, a water channel uh, where the this channel will collect water from yamuna river and distribute it into rajasthan area etc so uh, it's uh, currently it is uh, very hard to recognize this center uh, hydrology of uh, this particular channel as a river uh, but uh, in ancient periods this uh, this was a kind of a rain fed river a very long period even the historical uh, maurya and uh, now that uh, historical kings when they were ruling and even they also have uh, that uh, idea that this is this was an ancient rashtrakuti river uh, even though new names came to the river like uh, rakshi and chautang etc the name chautang exist is uh, existed a long time and of course in some parts of the channel you can see uh, it's a, you can see it as a river but currently it is being used as a uh, water drainage system channel mm -hmm. even yavyavati also has become the the alternate channel channel of yamuna yavyavati also becomes a kind of a uh, river system uh, water drainage channel where uh, the, the water from yamuna is collected and uh, distributed to the southern part of haryana uh, through yavyavati the, the, the water channel it's a, it is called yamuna canal etc so such, such uh, names has come actually so that is all about the uh, kind of uh, hydrology and geology of the river saraswati and uh, i think any archaeologists or people having some understanding about archaeology uh, they have very big significance to the river drishatvati because one of the oldest uh, uh, like uh, archaeological site which is which was in existence from 6000 bc onwards very old period raki gahi that is then located along the banks of drishatvati river so in most of the left, uh, leftist narrative all these uh, informations are downplayed they never say that raki garhi on a kind of an ancient river drishatvati and drishatvati is part of you uh, know one, one of the important river of rigveda none of these are very much uh, mentioned or stressed uh, because of which we always think that the the, the harappan civilization and uh, vedic civilization are separate and different etc but anybody understanding the geography they can know that this uh, raki gari raki gadi that is another term that uh, it is pronounced as raki gari or raki gadi so raki gadi is on, along the river uh, drishatvati and uh, very close to ramakrata right uh, the parashrama is ramakrata so this is a very important significance for our culture and civilization vedic civilization for example and uh, birana is much more older than raki gari like uh, it is uh, active since uh, 7900 bc 7000 years like the 7900 bc very 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 old so that uh, the one of the, uh, the i think this is the most ancient uh, settlement along the uh, the river saraswati that is of course like uh, you can actually see the different distance like this much distance only this much distance from Uh, river saraswati and of course it can be considered as on the banks of A apaya river and i have mentioned apaya river has even more ancient uh, ancient than the river saraswati because uh, the apaya river is an ancient course of the river saraswati so for example again the, this is a kind of uh, people make it a little bit confused because same river have multiple names and same river can change the course so all these things happen right so i'm saying uh, that earlier the saraswati river it was flowing like this that means the older course of river saraswati was like this that is the river will uh, saraswati river was flowing from the himalayas like this and at this point that is the northern corner of kurukshetra uh, the river the river was having a flow like this and it was passing through the manusha and elaspada and flowing like this passing close to birana and uh, uh, like uh, flowing like this so this is this uh, this particular lake is called the dwaita lake 
and uh, the forest around this dwaita lake is called dwaita vana where the pandavas were living in exile so they were uh, switching between kamyaka vana and dwaita vana uh, in the mahabharata you can see it very clearly and uh, i am writing the book on the mahabharata currently so so this is the region so up to here uh, from the uh, uh, this uh, northern uh, corner of kurukshetra up and up to dwaitavana uh, the river had a different course it was flowing like this like this like this uh, so i am actually you know combining two sessions together in this particular uh, like uh, uh, this, uh, this this particular session because uh, the uh, the information about rishadvadi and abaya rivers are uh, very small so in my book it is also two very small chapters so it makes sense to combine the uh, the the topic so both the rivers rishadvadi and abaya you, we will cover in this particular uh, this particular uh, session uh, because and it, they are all very two rivers very close by and both of them are currently tributaries of saraswati so what happens like because of hydraulic dynamic changes in the hydrology uh, the river uh, from here onwards the river made a different course like this so what happened this particular thing broken you know? this this much area got broken so this river become a rain, uh, small rain fed tributary of saraswati it was an ancient uh, channel of saraswati but after this breakage which happened uh, along this northern course of uh, northern point of kurukshetra uh, uh, th that is uh, arantuka after that uh, the river become a uh, stream small stream which flows through the middle of the kurukshetra and uh, slowly move like this etc so what it indicates uh, because apaya is also very much important right uh, during the period of Manu, that is uh, what I, my estimate is around 8000 BC, contemporary with the Birana, etc. Uh, this was the course of Saraswati, right? So Manu was living on the banks of Saraswati because see, the Manusha is you know, extremely close to the Apaya uh, river course. It is also close to Saraswati, but comparing to Saras this uh, Saraswati course, it was even flowing, uh, flowing close to the Apaya river. So Apaya is the oldest form of Saraswati, right? It is the oldest course of Saraswati. So during the period of Manu, Apaya was the Saraswati. Apaya and Saraswati uh, will be denoting the same river in 8000 BC when Manu was uh, living or uh, some somebody equivalent of Manu. So Manu and Ila. All of them are on the banks of the ancient Saraswati channel, that is Apaya. And in contemporaneous with Manu, the, this is 7900 BC, the Birana is there uh, along the course of Apaya river. So this is kind of a cradle of uh, our the, the, the most ancient sacred river of the, uh, even the most sacred Kurukshetra region. So it is a sacred among the most, a sacred of the sacred and very ancient and uh, that kind of a river uh, unfortunately even during the period of pandavas this river was almost non existent uh, because uh, but of course in the kurukshetra war there is a hint of the existence of this river uh, that is like for example uh, there is an incident right in the kurukshetra war uh, B uh, arjuna fought with the bhishma and uh, he fought Bhishma with uh, Shikandi in the front. So Bhishma was looking at Shikandi and uh, decided to uh, not to battle uh, because she, she ha he has uh, pledged uh, he won't battle with Shikandi, etc. So behind from behind Shikandi, Arjuna uh, shot arrows and uh, Bhishma uh, was falling down. Uh, he fell down a kind of a bed of arrows. So at that time, Arjuna, uh, all, everybody came because nobody wanted Bhishma to die. So Arjuna and the Pandavas, uh, Kauravas, uh, Yudhi, this uh, Yudhishthira and Duryodhana, everybody came and surrounded the Bhishma and he was asking for some water. And at that time, Arjuna sh was shooting an arrow into the soil where the Bhishma was fa falling down and water came out of uh, that uh, uh, soil. So, of course, this is all mentioned in a magical manner, but 
the the ancient course of the apaya see the here from here to here so bishma was uh, falling down somewhere around here actually you know like very close to the northern corner of kurukshetra uh, around somewhere around here the bishma was falling down in kurukshetra so wherever the bishma was falling the river apaya was having a channel there so it is like a uh, almost dried up river bed but underwater ex existence of water just below the surface so maybe a, some one or two one or one meter one or two meter below the surface there will be water and uh, i was mentioning in my book that if arjuna was shooting an arrow inside the river bed of apaya definitely the water will come out of that uh, uh, if it will create a hole and from that the water of apaya will come out come out and uh, uh, bishma can drink so even uh, the alternate ex ex explanation is that everything is a poetic narrative but there is a possibility of a historical and geographical uh, kind of uh, uh, means uh, a support for this kind of this uh, information in the mahabharata because geographically the river apaya was flowing uh, like uh, close to where the bishma is traditionally mentioned as uh, no having uh, that fall so that is a match up right so there is a matching up of the the the, the course of the apaya river and where the arjuna shot arrow and the water is coming from that uh, dried up river bed the apaya river was not there uh, during the period of mahabharata it was almost dried up and of course any channel even if you today also any channel is there water when the rain comes water will flow like even if it is just for one hour two hour the water will flow so that way the water was flowing into the apaya river but the river was already extinct uh, during the pandava period uh, it was just a river bed with no water flow so yeah so that is something about the apaya river uh, which is a very important part uh, which is very important and of course uh, the we we have already uh, noted down the apaya river is mentioned in a very you know, earliest sixth mandala period etc uh yeah, sixth and the seventh and eighth mandala I mean sorry sixth third and uh, seventh mandala so that is bharadwaja mandala and uh, vishwamitra mandala and vasishta mandala so during the early rigvedic period the river was apaya river was having a flow that is uh, whatever my date for early rigvedic period uh, is around 3300 bc uh, and uh, to up to uh, th uh, around 3000 bc etc so in the fourth millennium BC, the river was flowing, and that is why the Vishwamitra and uh, uh, Vishwamitra Prime prominently mentioned Apaya River along with Manusha, Ilaspada, and uh, uh, Saraswati, etc. So, that is the significance of the river Apaya, Apaya, uh, like that. So, and uh, uh, again, another point about Apaya is uh, this river becomes it's a very ancient like maybe it is a, one of the first river the the rigvedic people know that is why the the word apaya apaya that is a, it, it's a literal meaning is a flow of water apa means wa water apaya means a flow of water so it is a kind of a fundamental definition of a river river is nothing but flow of water so because of that the apaya river become a synonym for any river because it's so fundamental it's so ancient it's so fundamental that uh, any river is a flow of water right so then subsequently the the name apaya is uh, used to refer to many other rivers like uh, ganga is called apaya saraswati is called apaya even uh, even this uh, parishni river is also sometimes called apaya river uh, and uh, uh, the in the mahabharata period because the language have slightly modified the language undergoed evolution sanskritam language got undergone evolution so instead of the ya become ga so instead of apaya it become apaga apaga like that again the name uh, uh, the uh, meaning doesn't change it is water flow apaga like that so and even mahabharata bhishma is called apaga sutha apaga sutha uh, sutha sutha means son son of a river so in actually bhishma is attributed as the uh, son of ganga river but uh, Mahabharata terminology sometimes they will say Apaka Sudha. So uh, that is the son of the river. So here the Apaka is referring to Ganga river. 
and there are certain instances uh, where it refers to you know this satalaja shatatru river or uh, chandrabhaga uh, everything is mentioned as apaga so for example chandrabhaga uh, that uh, uh, yeah that, that is also like uh, described as apaga uh, and in rigveda it is called asikni and in the mahabharata it is called chandrabhaga and uh, uh, in the mahabharata karnaparva the chandrabhaga is mentioned as an apaka river uh, it means it's mentioned as apaka because it is a generic it become the, the this uh, river of kurukshetra apaya became a generic term and it become applied to many rivers so we have many instances like ganga is called as apaka and saraswati is sometimes called as apaka and uh, this uh, western uh, the, Pan, the river of punjab na chenab chandrabhaga uh, Chana, currently it is called Chenab, but it is uh, mentioned in the like Mahabharata Chandrabhaga. The so Chandrabhaga becomes a uh, no, very in a corrupted form, it becomes Chenab. But in the Rigveda, it is called Asikni River, the river of uh, Anavas or the Taitya Anavas or Asuras. That river is also mentioned as Sabaga. And that reference you can see in the Karna Parva between a conversation between Shalya and Karna. Uh, you can see that uh, the river Chandrabhaga is called Apaga. But which is the most ancient Abhaga? It was the ancient course of Saraswati. This, this course, this course, this ancient course of Saraswati, which was contemporary to Manu and the such ancient people. And what, what happened next? The river changed the course, Saraswati flow started flowing like this. And then what happened? This becomes a temporary river and a tributary of this old channel become a tributary of uh, Saraswati. And it was uh, draining into the Saraswati very close to the <coughs> Veta Lake, where the Pandavas uh, having the Vanavasa. So that is about the uh, Apakar. Then the Drishatvati, I think I mentioned a lot of things like uh, Drishatvati is this river and it has got two parts, uh, Rakshi, Rakshi River and then the Chautam River. And uh, it's uh, even within Rikveda itself, it's the northern part is called Hariyupya. And the southern part is Drishatpati. And in the somewhere in the middle Rigvedic period, uh, it is also called as Kulisi, the river name Kulisi. It is also the, another time of Drishatpati. And during Mahabharata period, it is also known as Raupya. So this is all about uh, Drishatpati river. Ah, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I left out anything. Yeah, and then Rakhi Garhi. That is the ancient, the 6000 BC settlement in the Harappan, uh, early Harappan period, or pre Harappan period, that is there in the uh, Trashatvadi and Virana, the even more ancient 7900 BC ancient settlement, again pre Harappan settlement is there along Apaga, Apaya River. The Apaga is, is Mahabharata term, Apaya is the Rigvedic term. Uh, so uh, Virana is there and Virana is 7900 BC so contemporaneous with Manu of 8000 BC and Ila of uh, Ila, Ila, the daughter of Manu they are all in the 8000-7000 BC that period all these things are there. Bharati Tirpa came up later like that. So that's slightly later actually. So all these things are matching up and this is this particular session also again informs us that uh, the uh, Rigvedic geography and the so called Harappan or pre Harappan geography, everything is same thing. They are not two different cultures. That again, repeatedly, we are getting the same result. And of course, uh, yeah, I, meant, I forgot to mention the Saptathama concept. So, in the Rakhi Karhi, when the people excavated it, they found seven settlements in that region, Rakhi Karhi, and similar, it's something similar in Birana also. Yeah. So this seven settlement concept is mentioned in the Rigveda tenth mandala, etc. About the uh, the the cluster of seven, uh, like uh, a cluster of seven settlements. I don't know what is the reason for the making seven settlements, but that kind of settle clusters, settlement clusters are mentioned in the Rigveda, and similarly in the archaeology, that kind of uh, uh, seven settlements uh, are mentioned. It is mentioned as Saptathama, and uh, that is there in the Rakhigari, uh, which is along the Rishabhadi. So that is another I prominently mentioned in my book, Rivers of Rigveda, about that Saptathama, which is correspondingly uh, uh, like uh, seen in the uh, archaeological settlements, where the seven settlements are seen together, clustered as just clustered together. And the last point I want to talk about is 
yeah because we know the kurukshetra is uh, uh, the region between saraswati and rishadvadi and of course i mentioned the city of kurukshetra uh, where the university of kurukshetra is situated is just one spot one small location inside the the, the kurukshetra uh, region so kurukshetra region is this much big right it is a big as big as a district so in that this big region only the north uh, this uh, some kurukshetra city is somewhere here very close to the northeastern corner and the kurukshetra city is a very recent uh, city which was established uh, maybe if i if i remember correctly around within 100 years uh, the city of kurukshetra is founded uh, and uh, expanded so people should not confuse the city of kurukshetra with the kurukshetra region uh, which is uh, described in the mahabharata and uh, in the ram uh, in the in the rigveda as vara prithvi and nabha prithvi so that region is this it's not about the kurukshetra city which is like this dot some in the very close to the east, uh, this uh, northeastern corner of kurukshetra the kurukshetra city is different kurukshetra region is different 